today we have the crossover protector. I've got a tensioner here that I've glued onto the drill pin um, and that allows us to tension. And you can see here the serial code is 178926 indicating it was made in the early 1910s that's unique to the lock. And we'll just show we have the cutaway side, well cutaway is the wrong word, I don't know what these are. <laughs> um, we have those installed, we have the actuator there, and we have two of the three screws, I don't have the third one, it doesn't matter. So, tension, we've got a two millimeter piece of hardened steel rod interfacing here. And we've got this um, bent piece of music wire and filed that goes inside and allows us to tension there. And we just pick with hooks, that's all there is. So this one is actually super lucky in how its bidding works, um, this I will say, because uh, also there's an unsprung wafer at the front that we're going to just poke here. Uh, yeah. um, because all the ones that go push to the right are pushable from the top, and all the ones that kind of go towards the bottom pushable from the bottom. Uh, so just to explain we have um, fairly heavy tension. It actually is very painful to tension like this. Um, uh, you can actually see the tension of bending a bit. And the protector has a unique kind of thing. I don't know how to put it. Um, where? Ow! <laughs> Holy shit! Um, <laughs> where? Ow! Uh, I don't know why it's so painful today. Where? When you push a wafer to roughly the right spot after a few have been lifted already, um, what happens is that they reach kind of a fairly hard stop, and then they um, and then they move again. So that the second movement is obviously the overset. You don't want that. Uh, so you can use that to sort of identify when you're when you should stop lifting. And obviously the false gates in this particular one play with that but it's still a good way to judge when you should stop. Um, mapping it also helps. Jiggle works pretty well. Uh, what have I forgotten to mention? I know I've forgotten something. Ow. Ah, so this is the, um, this particular version has less wafers um, than the most protectors. So some protectors have 11, most have 11, some have 16. This one has eight or nine, um, and it's used specifically for post cassettes back in the day. So this is a 1910s lock. Uh, it makes up for the less wafers, and obviously because it's so old, it doesn't have the it doesn't have split wafers. But um, I'll demonstrate later why those don't affect the pick that much. Uh, so yeah. Um, it makes up for not having the modern features and having less wafers. Well, it doesn't make up for having not having the modern features. But it makes up for having less wafers by um, having some other security features that are pretty unique as far as I've seen. At least I haven't seen them in other locks, in other protectors, which is um, they, it has false gates on the wafers, which is very interesting. And it has a tapered inner housing, which I'll show at the end if I manage to get this open for once. Um, sorry, I'm just going to focus for a sec. So, 
so this one has doesn't have the word links written on the front which means it opens clockwise and these locks are much easier to pick counterclockwise uh. ow Um, so, I don't, let me just explain what these do. Um, so obviously this, the, the one, the long tensioner provides clockwise tension, you needed to pick, whatever. Uh, this one, so the chroma protector is very famous for having a very tapered effect. This one just helps minimize that. It pushes down on the stack so it holds wafers together a bit. Um, so what this this has two effects. Um, first, is it reduces the amount of tapering, and actually it reduces it kind of depending on how much force I apply right on the two tensioners. So I've actually had runs uh, on the cutaway version, which I'll demonstrate at the end of this video, or maybe in another video, if I get it. <laughs> um, where with like sort of a miracle run I get it open within like 10 minutes because each wafer just sets to true and stays there um, sync kind of like the Mersey method that I think Grav uses um, So, um, I can manipulate the this with my pick, with my hook, but I'd rather not. Or rather, it's just easier to check with a bit of wire. It feels good. Well, since it feels good, I'm glad we don't have that anymore. Oh, I have more wires. Um, so the crown protector around here likes to do something where everything is roughly very close to set and it's in the tapered section but it's incredibly tapered at this section it's very hard to feel what's not in there um, without the downward tension of this stage can take like an hour <laughs> and with it um, one slip up means you start again Again. But uh, we'll see. Ow. I'm kind of losing finger feeling in my left hand.
should be fine. So over at this stage, what I do is I use a lot more force um, on my pick, not my tensioner. Uh, if I wasn't using downward tensioner, I have to use normal force, but I, without a downward tensioner, I've never got an open on more than seven or eight wafers. So, um, I've noticed in the cutaway that when something feels really close to say, oh god, I almost dropped everything, <laughs> holy shit, when something feels really close to set, uh, sometimes it's actually like, like, um, I can't even see it, it's like half a millimetre, maybe a quarter of a millimetre overset, so mm. I've found um, that it helps to, if something tests kind of weirdly on this side, I go on the opposite side and I just push it the tiniest amount. And if it's, um, uh, to reach the last one to its final position, I need this hook. It feels decent. Um, yeah, generally the most, the ones that I like to unset the most are kind of near the uh, downward tensioner. So that's generally the first and second on each side. That is the front four, I guess. The rest tend to stay set, but um, that also depends on me. Double check this. Um, 
So obviously this downward tensioning thing is kind of more of a lock spot thing. It's very difficult to, you get a lot less feedback if you don't know the boat fitting already. But it is still doable, I should note. Um, especially when you reach the second tapered phase on this particular one. I haven't tested on the other one. Um, I'll show you the other one at the end perhaps, or in another video as I said. Um, Yeah, when you get to the second tapered stage, you can insert this in a normal pick. Uh, if you win a blind pick, rather. And it should still help, as far as I can tell. Um, I can tell when lifting one side unsets the other, because this tensioner will shift uh, an almost imperceptible amount, but I can feel it because of the amount of pressure I'm putting down. I have a cut at the end of this session. Ah, no, please. <laughs> oh, thank God. <laughs> the downward tension can slip um, with my design. I haven't improved one, but I haven't made it. And if you don't rescue it really quickly um, before it completely slips off, if you cannot, it's impossible. You you will drop everything back to the tapered stage, the start of the tapered stage. three wafers left here in the tapered stage. I've got them here a number of times. I've got them to one wafer before. But if you just drop, if you overset, you do have to restart. Or rather restart the tapered stage which I'm yeah, which is just a restart because Good luck doing more than one picking session. I think all the back ones are completely set. Let's double check the last one. Yep. It's just these two. Um, So, 
something that I'm sure I'm going to see brought up. So if I pick it uh, and post it on LPU, is um, isn't glue destructive or whatever? Or isn't it cheating? Well, this glue takes a while to set. Uh, it takes four hours or so. Um, come on. Yeah, it takes four hours or so to set, and it is removable. I will show you one way to remove it just with some pliers. You can do this from the front because it sticks out. Um, but, yeah, um, you can do it with pliers and a special chisel. I'll show you the chisel too. I have it. Um, but, um, but from the back, um, oh, from the back, no, from the front, uh, without any tools, you can actually just use a heat gun. Uh, so with a heat gun, you can. This is insane. With a heat gun, you can uh, heat the glue to about 200 Celsius. So this is an epoxy. And this particular one that I've used, or obviously another pick might use a different one with this method, the epoxy debonds at 200 degrees, uh, at which point with a pair of pliers you can remove it very easily. I wouldn't recommend a blowtorch. Uh, I don't have a heat gun here, so well, also I'm not using a heat gun at 200 degrees in my bedroom. So we will be using the pliers method today and I'll show you it. There's one way because it's really hard to reach. It's here. Here. It's hard to test. Um, it's easy to lift in the first place because you don't need to be precise when you're lifting the first time, but it's very hard to test. You can see it, well, I don't know if you can see, you can see it's dropped into a little bit of a false set, and as the taper goes, it will drop slightly more. It's, uh, at the end, you might see it visible, it's about, it's about a degree over the course of the entire pick. Ow. It's hard to see because I bend the tensioner slightly, okay. <laughs> also, without the downward tensioner when I was doing the cut thing, um, it wasn't bending slightly, it was bending like 45 degrees, and I was still not getting opens. Stuff would just drop too easily. So from the cutaway, these two, uh, it is the second one on the left, and the second one not including the, uh, not including the springless on the right, these two bounce for ages. There we go. Holy fucking shit, it's open. <laughs> I don't know if you can see, but I can, can't move my left hand. Holy fuck. Finally. Ow. <laughs> I'm just not gonna block it, but can you see? <laughs> Ow. <laughs> Ow, motherfucker. It's like 
bright red in comparison. Uh, uh, okay. Let me just show it's picked once my hand recovers a bit. We've got <laughs> tension marks on all of my fingers. Ow. That is, I think, take well over a hundred of this lock. How long was it? 25 minutes, not bad. Not as good as the cutaway, but far from bad. Ow. Alright, let's make sure it's somewhere where you guys can see. demonstrate that it's picked without taking it off camera. See that actuator moving? There we go. Let's change the camera angle. God. <sighs> Holy fucking shit. I cannot believe it. <laughs> Holy fuck. I am well pleased with that. I've been going at this lock for so many hours, you would not believe. I bought it, um, not this particular one, but I bought my first Crown Protector in March, and I've been picking it so much since then. I've spent well over 200 hours. Holy fucking shit. Come on, get off. So I'm just going to put this down, and just... Make sure we do everything on camera, so forgive me if it's slow. Let me relock it. Uh, which way is relock? This way. So. As with all chroma protectors, in theory, there's a bit of grease on it, which is unpleasant. But if you work with the lock, and that's just how it is. Uh, and they do tend to be very annoying to guard. <laughs> Let's just make a hundred percent sure we don't go out of frame. They tend to get a bit stuck when you, while you're pulling them out, you tilt it a little bit. Uh, so, and you can see that it's, you know, in order. Uh, we're running out of space, so we will go on the other side. Uh, this one is big, so it is hard to get out. This is the last one, which is easy to get out. So this is a newer one and it doesn't have the back plate. <sighs> okay. Um, what do I show you first? We'll 
show you the tools at the end. Um, this off. I ended up using these tools. Um, so I'm just going to show you from a distance first because it's I'm going to obscure something inevitably if I show you up close first. So we have this is the housing. You can see the number 23 there that um, you can use to indicate the correct locked position. These slide up, they don't do anything. One of them slides out at least, I'm pretty sure the other one doesn't, which is kind of funny. Yeah, oh, actually does. We'll take these out entirely then. This is the, um, this is the inner ring, so it goes in here like this. Actuators on the back of it. They are one piece. Um, this is the lid and the keyway. It's just a single piece of steel, basically. Uh, yep, I've shown these three now. Oh, I haven't shown the back of this. So this is literally the back of the lock. I'll show you. See. Um, so this is the first one. You can see number nine two six, and you can see there's the back of it. And I'll show you just how some of it works. Oh, by the way, the keys here. Um, this is number the next one. You can see the number seven on there, uh, and there's the spring. The spring does come off these. Uh, and I'm showing you the back. There's seven. There's the back. I'll show you them close up again later. Here's number six. You can see the six. And there's the back. Again, spring comes off. five you can see the number there you can see a lot of scratches um, that's where I was tensioning so um, to explain something so these go back to front and I was tensioning downwards off this one where the scratches are um, the ones closest to where I tension downwards are the ones that ping pong the most at the end so if you tension downwards here these two ping pong at the end but because this one is really hard to reach, I tension here, um, which means these two ping pong really hard at the end. All right, yeah, so five, and the reverse of five, um, and I'll just make sure spring is removable. And there's just grease on them, so here's number four. Grease is important. If there's no grease, not only will the lock not function properly, but um, but the my tension method won't work because the stack will stick together as you tension downwards, which makes a ping pong. Um, yep, yeah, there's four. Ow. <laughs> there's four. And the reverse of four. And here's the spring coming off. Here's number three. You can see the number. So they do go in order and they are numbered. And the 
that's number three, both sides. Swing came off. So this is the, this one is a double, that's number two. It is um, a full circle. You can see some interesting features, like this little groove here. These are for, we got this here as well. So pretty much everything in this has a purpose. Um, this one has two points of contact with the key, which is particularly uh, difficult for key duplication. And this is the back one, number one. Uh, number one is visible. And I will show you the false gates in these in a minute. They're very, they're more like serrations, to be honest. This, I've never figured out the purpose of, because this only affects, uh, <laughs> this only affects it in the direction that you relock. So I guess it stops you from picking to relock for some reason. Let me just wipe my fingers off. Because this is ridiculous. Um, let me show you how to remove this. Firstly. So, all you gotta do is grab the bit that's poking out. You can do this from the front. You just twist, crush it. So the glue is getting crushed. Um, the part that's on the outside. go at it from a few different angles. There we go. And you just need to spin it a bunch basically until it comes out. And here is the tensioner. So it just fits over the top here. And to clean the glue off afterwards, this can actually be done from the outside of the lock with a thin enough chisel. I've got a slightly thicker one here. I do have a thin one up there, but it's a tedium to use. Uh, and all you do is you can just reach in and just chisel the glue off. Uh, this this is a wood chisel. So, uh, well, it's a wood carving chisel to be exact uh, on the terminology. Uh, so, uh, it's a bit uh, it's it's soft, basically, the metal. And I've actually done this a few times already to make sure that the technique works. So my, this one is so soft that it's um, fully blunt. But it does work. And it, it leaves minimum scratches because of that. Uh, because it's a lot softer than the material. Perhaps a brass chisel would be even better, but its lifespan would be maybe one or two uses maximum. And I'll show you that there's been no real damage to the lock after this. Just grab a tissue to clean that off. Now we 
can show close ups. I've already shown you everything somewhat close up, but we'll do it even closer. Let's make sure stuff still stays in frame if possible. Uh, so these are the most important. So we have wait for one. Back. Front. And you can maybe see a little mark there on the side. That's the false gate. It's like it goes across. It's a serration. So wait for two. Front. Back. There are three false gates there. Very effective. Uh, just on the edge. Wait for the next one. Wait for three. Three false gates again. Two false gates on this side. Wait for four. Gates, no false gates there. Huh. Two false gates there. Hard to see, but they're there. Some false gates here. Number five. Number six. Three false gates again. Number seven. And the unsprung last one. So obviously it's unsprung, there's no point having false gates on this. Um, these are your two end pieces, they're literally just bits of steel. You have your two screws. There should be a third one, it's missing. Uh, here's your lid, and that's the keyway. No modifications there. The reverse, it's just a flat piece of metal. You can see that's pretty clean. The, spin, uh, the drill pin. There's still a little bit that I missed. I'll get that in a sec. Oh no. I don't know. Might be. I'll check. Yeah. You can see that's the hole. Those are the holes where the springs go. Some on both sides. Other than that, it's just that. These are flat. And that's that. And here is the outer housing, which has a few interesting features to note. The first is that on the so it goes in here, the wafers go here and here, and when they all come inside it opens, there's the back. This side is chamfered, so this is when you're picking it anti-clockwise, um, and that is for relocking it. I'll demonstrate what that does in a bit. This side, you have tapering on the inside of here, it's hard to see, you can maybe see it from this angle. I'll zoom in more later, when I'm reassembling it. Uh, you have tapering on this side too, uh, and that is for pick resistance, that makes it extremely tapered. Yeah, so I think that's all the parts shown, now for the tools. This is the first tensioner, it's got a soft end that I made with duct tape from the old tension method, it doesn't do anything anymore, a bit of hardened steel, that's literally it. This is for the top. Um, this is for moving this, it just goes in here, like that. This is my downward tensioner, pushes down like that, and it's got a flat end, it's been filed. These are the two picks I used, it just hooks, South Lord Postal Hook and Jimmy Long's Deep Hook, Deep Flat, and that is pretty much it for tools. Um, yeah, that's all the parts shown, so I'm going to put you back in the, here, now, and we're going to rebuild the lock. So, 
you can see the number I showed this earlier the number 23 is here number 23 is here as well um, they're both pretty subtle but they're visible uh, that is the top side and you just put the numbers in matching there oh, let me double check the glue is all gone to do that I just put the key on the drill pin and if it spin, goes up down and spins smoothly it's good Let's get this done. Number three goes here. Number four. And we're just going to double check. Yep. Uh, for something to note, by the way. It's a very unique feature. This, the, see how the back one is a bit that juts into the keyway. If the key has a cutout there that interfaces with that, so a normal key blank will not be able to go into the keyway. That's just a feature of chroma protectors. Uh, that can be in varied locations and whatnot. It's very effective. Number six. Upside down, isn't it? Yep, seven, eight. All right, and we'll get these end pieces in too. So there you go, and the tapered section is visible just there. Yeah. That is the lock. Thank you for watching, um, pretty much. And I want to put this back in the stand so. the wafers sit this way, it goes into the chamfer and then they align the other way, they just align and they turn. Yep, pretty simple and this goes on top. It only goes on in one arrangement because of these two pins that interface with two pins, two holes, here and here. Holy fucking shit, we're finally done. And these are reverse threaded, so they thread in normally and then from the back you pull them out with a screwdriver. And again with the key, just demonstrate it works. Chroma Protector picked. Thank you for watching.